Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video we're going to finish up our discussion on real numbers. So in the previous video we talked about how to locate and label points on a real number line, simplify expressions containing the absolute value, how to identify the opposite of a number, and then we finally translated phrases between English and written in mathematical symbols. In this video we're going to talk about how to find a perimeter and area of very common geometric shapes such as squares, rectangles, and triangles. And then we're going to spend some time on solving problems involving sets and subsets. All right, let's start with formulas for area and perimeter. So a square, rectangle, and triangle are very common geometric shapes that we'll encounter in the course. We're going to talk about perimeter and area for these three common shapes. So notice that the diagram or this geometric figure has a square, rectangle, and triangle. It has the formula for area and perimeter actually indicated above the shape. So we have the dimensions of the shapes labeled with variables because the length and the width or the height could be any real number. So they have to be represented with variables. So the formulas for perimeter and area will also be in terms of variables, in terms of the dimensions. So perimeter just means distance around the geometric figure or geometric shape. A square has all four sides the same length. So if you represent the length of one side as S, then all four sides will have length S. So 1S plus another S gives you 2S plus another S, 3S, and you have 4S. So 4 times the length of one of the sides gives you the perimeter. The area of a square is length, which is S, width, which is S. So length times width is S times S, or S squared. Rectangle is very similar to a square, except the length and the width are not the same. So you have width, we'll use W for width, and length we'll use L. So you have two widths, and you have two lengths. So perimeter would be W plus W is 2W. L plus L is 2L. So 2L plus 2W is the perimeter of a rectangle. The area of a rectangle is length times width, so L times W. And then the third one, third geometric shape that's very common, is a triangle. A triangle, you should think of it as it's half of a rectangle. So the area is 1 half times the B times H. B represents the base the side that the triangle is sitting on, and then the H is representing the height, the very top of the triangle versus its base. Make sure that you remember these formulas for the perimeter and area of a rectangle, a square, and a triangle, because we're going to need that for example 5. So example 5, we're going to find the area and perimeter. So number 1, find the perimeter and area for the following figure, which is a square. So each of the sides will have length 5 feet. So let's find out the perimeter first. The perimeter would be 4 times S. S is representing the length of one of the sides. The length will be 5 feet. So you have 4 times 5 feet, which is 20 feet. Notice that perimeter doesn't have square units. It's just a distance. So perimeter is 20 feet around this square. Now area, area for a square is S squared. So you're going to take the length of one of the sides and square that number. Square that real number. So 5 feet is the length of one of the sides and you square it, which will give you 5 squared is 5 times 5 or 25. And now you have feet squared. So notice that area has square units. It's feet times feet, so feet squared. So this takes care of the square. Let's move on to the rectangle. So number two, this rectangle has a length of eight inches and a width of six inches or a height of six inches. So let's again find out the perimeter first. The perimeter is two times the length plus two times the width. So in other words, the distance all around the rectangle. So you have 
2 times 8 inches is the length, plus 2 times the width, the width is 6 inches. So 2 times 8 is 16, plus 2 times 6 is 12. So 16 inches plus 12 inches will give you 28 inches. So again, perimeter just means distance. It's distance around the, the rectangle. You're not going to have square units. It's just talking about the distance around the object. Now let's do area. The area is length times width. So length was 8 inches. Width was 6 inches. And we are multiplying these two real numbers together. 8 times 6 is 48. And we have to multiply the units as well. Units is inches times inches. So you have inches squared. So again, area has square units, inches squared. So this takes care of the rectangle. And then finally, the triangle. We have many different sides labeled, but we're only concerned with the base and the height. We're going to find out the perimeter first, and then we'll find out the area. So the perimeter, there's not a nice geometric formula for a perimeter of a triangle. It's just add up all three sides of the triangle. So you have length 20 meters, 15 meters, and 25 meters. So 20 meters plus 15 meters plus 25 meters means that the perimeter is 20 plus 15 plus 25 will give you 60 meters. So that's the distance around the triangle. And now the area. The area of a triangle is one half times base times height. So we'll use A for area. The base is the side the triangle is sitting on. It is 25 meters. So one half times 25 meters times the height. The height is from the top of the triangle to its base. So the top of the triangle to the base is labeled as a length of 12 meters. So 1 half times 25 times 12 will give you 150. And then the units would be meters times meters, so meters squared. So that's how you can find the perimeter and the area of these three geometric shapes. Make sure that you remember these formulas for area and perimeter of those three geometric shapes. The next thing that we're going to talk about in this video is called sets and subsets. So a set in math is a collection of objects or things. Typically they're numbers. It's a set of numbers, a real, of real numbers, or a subset of real numbers, but they're just a collection of objects or things. Each of the objects that are in a set are called elements or members of the set and you represent sets with capital letters. So you, if you want to say that is set A, you would use capital A. And the elements are represented with lowercase letters. So if you want to say that uh, X is in the set, you would use lowercase x. And now subset. The definition of a subset is set A is a subset of set B if every element in A is also an element in B. In other words, everything in A is in B. B might be larger, but everything in A is in B. So A is a subset of the set B. Okay, so there is one special set that contains no elements. So a set with no members or no elements in it its name is called the empty set or the null set. It has a special notation. It's a O or a circle with a slash through it. That's the symbol representing the empty set. And one common property about the empty set is that the empty set is considered a subset of any set you can think of. So what we can do with sets is we can actually have operations on them. So two basic operations with sets is called the union and the intersection. So let's talk about union first. The union of two sets 
and we're going to call these set A and set B. So capital letter A and capital letter B. The union is represented with a U between the two sets. So this is the union of A and B. Now what it means is this. It's the set of all elements that are either in A or in B or in both. That's what the union means. It means the element is in the union if it's in A or it's in B or it could be in both. So you can think of union as the word or in math. So it's in A or in B. Now this or, this or is an inclusive or. It's in one or the other or both. So that's why union is the inclusive or. All right, intersection. The intersection of two sets, A and B, has a different notation. So it's the union, but it's upside down. This means intersect or intersection. So it's A intersect with B. It is a set of all elements that are in A and B. So the key word is and with intersection. So you can think of A intersect B as what is in common with A and B. It has to be in A and it has to be in B together. So it has to be in both to be in the intersection. So this gives you a good representation of what the union and intersection actually means for two different sets. These are called Venn diagrams. What a Venn diagram is used for is just a visual representation of a set. So this oval represents set A. This oval represents set B. The union is saying the union is everything. So if it's in A, you're in the union. If it's in B, it's in the union. And if it's in A and B, it's also in the union. So everything is in the union. The intersection of A and B is where do the two ovals overlap? Or where do they intersect? So it's what's in common in A and B. Well, if it's in A and B, it has to be in this part that looks like a football. So that gives you a basic idea of what the union and intersection means in terms of elements. Let's do an example. Example six, union and intersection. The set A, so capital A, you have these curly brackets. Like I said in the previous video, curly brackets can be used for set notation. So this means the set A has the elements two, four, and six. So it has the numbers two, four, and six in it. The set B has the numbers zero, one, and three, and that's it. C has the numbers one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. That dot, dot, dot just means the numbers will go on forever in that same pattern. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on is in this set C. So set C is infinite. It has an infinite number of numbers in it. All right, number one, A union B. So if it's in the union, if the element's in the union, it has to be in A or B or both. So let's write them out. So curly brackets for the set. It is in A to be in the union. So A has 2, 4, and 6. B has 0, 1, and 3. And it looks like A and B have nothing in common. So that's everything. So the union would be 2, 4, 6, 0, 1, and 3. Now, this is OK as an answer. When you use set notation, it doesn't matter what order you put the, the elements in. But if you want to put them in numerical order, you can. Set notation, these are equal. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6 would be that set A union B. Okay, number 2, A intersect B. So this means what do A and B have in common? Well, A has 2, B doesn't. So that's 2 is not in common. 4 is not in common, 6 is not in common, 0 is not in common, 1 is not, and 3 is not. So A and B have nothing in common. So what is the set we can use to say it has nothing in it? The empty set. 
So zero with a slash through it or an O with a slash through it is called the empty set. No elements or members in common. So even though there's nothing in common, it, the answer is still a set. It's the set of nothing in it, which is called the empty set. Okay, number three, find out the set A union C. So it has to be an A, or the element has to be in C, or both. So let's find out what this would be. So it's the set. So it has to be an A, so let's write those out. Two, four, and six. Those are the elements in A already. C is one. Two we already have, so we don't have to, we don't have to list it again. Three, and then four is in there. Well, you already have that one listed. Five is in C. Six is in both of them, and then so on. So dot, dot, dot. So that would be the, the set A union C. It would be what's in A, what's in C that we don't already have listed, and then C goes on forever, so I need the dot, dot, dot. So let's write this in numerical order. You have the number one, the number two, three, four, five, six, and then so on. You will have any whole number after six in this set. So one note to make is that you only list an element or member once. So even though the numbers two and four appeared in A and C, you only have to list it once when you're talking about union or set notation. Okay, number four, A intersect C. So in other words, what is in common, what elements are in common with A and C? It would be the set, so set notation. It has to be in A and C together. So two is in A and C. Any other numbers? Well, I see four is in A, and four is also in C. And I see six is in A. Six will be in C as well, because C continues that same pattern forever. But that's it. Just two, four, and six is in the intersection. Okay, so now let's talk about set notation. So another way you can represent sets is to describe them using set builder notation or just set notation for short. So here's how you can write set builder notation for a union of two sets A and B. So A union B. You can write this as set, so curly brackets still. This union will be all elements. So we're going to let X be the element. The vertical bar means such that. So this means it's the set of all elements x such that, so after this vertical bar, you have to give some kind of condition for this number or this object to be in this set. So after the vertical bar, we have the condition that x is the element, is in A or B. And that's what the union means. If you're in the union, the element must be in A or the element must be in B. And this or is an inclusive or. Okay, which means that it's one or the other or both. That's what inclusive or means. So you would read this as the set of all X's such that X is a member of A or X is a member of B. And that's how you would read that using set notation. We'll be talking more about set notation as we go further into the course. All right, and then the last thing we're going to talk about in this video is what's called having subsets of the real number system. So we've already talked about the real numbers a lot in the previous video. 
there are several different types of sets that are subsets of the real number system. So we have the set of counting numbers. So counting numbers are like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. Sometimes the counting numbers are called the natural numbers. So if you have the set of 1, 2, 3, and then so on, the dot, 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 that's called the set of counting numbers or the set of natural numbers. Every single number is in this set is also a real number. So that's why this is a subset of the real numbers. If you take the, the natural numbers and you add zero to it, this is what's called the whole numbers. So every single number in this set is also a real number. So the set of whole numbers is a subset of the real numbers. If you take all the whole numbers and their opposites, you get what's called the integers. So the integers are also a subset of the set of real numbers. So you have dot, dot, dot. That includes all the whole numbers that are opposites. You have negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. And then you have all the whole numbers, 0, and then 1, 2, 3, and so on. So these are all the integers. The set of rational numbers. Rational numbers are just another way of saying fraction. So it's the set of all fractions, a divided by b, where a and b are integers. So this does include signed numbers, positive and negative real numbers, as long as they are fractions. So you could have like 4 divided by 1. 4 is an integer. 1 is an integer. So 4 divided by 1 is in this set of rational numbers. You have a rational number as long as the denominator is not 0. You cannot divide by 0. It doesn't exist. So the set of rational numbers is a subset of the real numbers. So with rational numbers, the denominator cannot be 0. Okay. If you do have 0 in the denominator, it would be what's called undefined. It's not a real number. All right, so it looks like we have talked about several different types of subsets. There's the subset of natural numbers, the whole numbers, the integers, the rational numbers, and then there are some real numbers that are not natural numbers or whole numbers or integers nor rational numbers. So you have what's called the set of irrational numbers also. So these are real numbers that are not in any of these other four. So you have the set of x's. So these are x's are real numbers, but they're not rational. What that means is that this set would be any real number that cannot be written as a fraction where the numerator and denominator are integers. So here are some examples. Square root of 2. Square root of 2 cannot be written as a fraction of two integers. Okay, square root of 2, if you put this into a calculator, it's approximately equal to 1.4142135.62 dot dot dot. The dot 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 at the end means this decimal will go on forever and there is no pattern to the decimals. So this is called an irrational number. It cannot be written as a fraction. This 1.4142135.62 and so on cannot be written as a fraction. Nor can the opposite of square root of 3. That's irrational. 4 plus 2 square root of 3. That's irrational. And pi. Pi is also an irrational number. Okay, if you remember pi, it has a decimal that does not stop. Or terminate. And there is no pattern. In the decimal. So if that's the case, if you have a decimal that does not stop and no pattern to it, it's an irrational number. So example seven, we're going to understand what does it mean to be a natural number, 
a whole number, an integer, a rational number, and irrational number, and also a real number. So classifying real numbers. So example seven. For the set, negative seven, negative 4.5, zero, two thirds, square root of two, square root of seven, and 12, list the real numbers that belong to each of the following subsets. And we have them listed here. All right, whole numbers. This would be the set of which numbers? Well, whole number, that's not negative seven. That's not a whole number. Zero is a whole number. So zero would be in the set. And it looks like 12 would also be in the set. So whole numbers would consist of zero and 12 from this subset we have. Integers. Integers are the whole numbers and their opposites. So negative seven is an integer. Zero is also an integer. Uh, two thirds is not, square root of two is not, square root of seven is not, but 12 is. So that's the set of integers consisting of those rational numbers. The rational numbers would be any whole number or integer or a fraction. So negative seven, you can put negative seven divided by one to make it a fraction. So it's a rational number. Negative 4.5, that's a decimal and the decimal stops at five. So it has a terminating decimal. So it is rational. You can write negative 4.5 as negative nine divided by two to make it a fraction. Zero, you can put zero divided by anything and you'll get zero so make it, to make it a fraction. Two thirds is rational and so is 12. For the same reason as negative seven, you can put 12 divided by one to make it a fraction, okay? What about the irrational numbers? The irrational numbers are the ones that cannot be written as a fraction of two different integers. So we have square root of two. We already said that was irrational. And we also have the square root of seven. If you type square root of seven into the calculator, you'll get a non-terminating decimal that has no pattern. So it's irrational as well. Now, the most important point of this example seven is that no matter what subset we classified each of these numbers as, every single one of these numbers is also a real number. So the real numbers would be negative seven, negative 4.5, zero, two thirds, square root of two, square root of seven, and 12. All seven of them are real numbers. It's just those whole numbers, integers, rational numbers, and irrational numbers, these are subsets of the real numbers. So this diagram gives you a visual representation of the relationship between the subsets of the real number system. Now, we can't list all the numbers, but we can give some examples of each one in each box. So the real numbers, then you have the real numbers can consist of irrational or rational numbers. So those that cannot be written as a fraction and those that can, a fraction of two integers. Now, if they're rational, you can also have integers or you can have non-integers. So integers are ones that are whole numbers and they're opposites. And those that are not are called non-integers. If they're integers, they can be zero, the number zero. They can be positive or they can be negative. That gives you an idea of what the subsets of the real number system can look like. So this finishes up our discussion on the real numbers. If you have any questions about any examples in this video related to perimeter, area, set notation, union, and intersection, or subsets of the real number system, please let me know. Or if you have any questions about any of the problems in the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about exponents and the order of operations.